All right, so yesterday we talked about radical halogenation of alkanes, and I always remind students that before you start this uh, mechanism, you should always identify the hydrogen that, if abstracted, leads to the most stable radical. And we said that radicals follow the same stability trends as carbocations. We said the steps are broken down into three components. First step's initiation, where you break a bond and form radicals. Second step is propagation, where you start off with a radical and then you regenerate that radical. And ideally, this can go over and over and over again in a cyclic fashion until your reagent's completely used up. And then in the last step, you've got a termination, where you take two radicals, combine them, and you end up with a neutral organic or inorganic compound. And then one thing I said is if you have excess reagent, you can continue to overhalogenate. So oftentimes you are very careful with how much bromine you add because you only add it to, want it added to one position. And then I went on and showed you guys that radical chlorination is a lot less selective than bromination, so we typically don't see it very often. And then what was the problem with fluorination? It was, too it was way too reactive. It was nearly impossible to control, so it's not synthetically useful. All right, today we're going to look at a new type of reaction, but it's very, very similar. This is called allylic bromination. So let's start off by drawing cyclohexene. That was one of the compounds we've made in lab. <coughs> and then we've got a bunch of different proton types on here. We've got a blue proton, or sorry, I should say hydrogen. Blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, and red hydrogen. Which of these do you think is going to result in the most stable radical if we abstract it? The blue one, green one, or red one? The red one? Well, let's try it. So let's say, all right, minus H dot, and let's draw that structure. All right, if we do that, that means we'd have a radical right there. All right, let's maybe do the second one. I'll do minus green dot. We'd have the radical right there. Makes sense. And then last but not least, we could have minus blue hydrogen. And that would result in this radical, right? So like I said yesterday, before you begin, always do this check. All right, which of these radicals is most stable? This is kind of tricky. If we look at them, they all look like secondary radicals, right? Are there any that are special secondary radicals, meaning maybe they have resonance or some other stabilizing feature? Yeah, the red one we can't push electrons around, but the green one we can, and we could say, you know, we could do resonance pushing or arrow pushing and delocalize this radical so that it's right here. That means that this hydrogen CH bond is the easiest to break. Since it results in a resonance stabilized radical. kind of cramming this in here. And does anybody remember the name of that specific hydrogen? We went over it yesterday. Allylic. It's allylic, right? I kind of gave it away in the title here. So this is referred to as our allylic hydrogen or allylic proton, depending on what sort of chemistry you're doing. It's always the proton that's right next door to your alkene. And it's unusually reactive because that bond is so weak and the resulting radical or cation is resonance stabilized. So it's unusual that way. <coughs> All right, so let's take a look at an example reaction here. And I'll show you guys a problem. Oftentimes what students do is they say, All right, if we treat this with elemental bromine and UV light, we would anticipate the bromine getting attached onto the position with the most stable radical, 
and in this case you could end up with an enantiomer. However, this is not observed. Instead, if you actually carry out this experiment, you'll get halogenation. Does anybody know why? I'll give you a hint. Yesterday I said in the initiation step, when you're breaking that BRBR bond, only a very, very small portion of it is actually forming the radical. What do you think that is doing here? It's kind of weird to think about, but the halogenation is just simply outcompeting the radical reaction. The radical reaction is a little bit slower and it just doesn't have enough time to take place. The halogenation reaction is really, really quick and it outcompetes any of the radical chemistry. And this was a problem, however, chemists are clever people and they like to find solutions. So then the question is, how can we minimize the amount of Br2 in solution? We don't want anti-addition of bromine. We want to brominate the allylic position. So we really need to focus on minimizing the amount of Br2 in solution. And in order to do this, they actually developed an alternate reagent, and I'll show you guys what that looks like. And this alternate reagent involves a five-membered ring with nitrogen in it. Got a carbonyl up here, down here, and a bromine coming off of that nitrogen. And this nitrogen also has a lone pair along with the oxygens. This is called N-bromo succinamide. This is obviously a mouthful to say, so people just abbreviate this as NBS. So I'll just say AKA NBS. But the neat thing with this reaction is we don't have any Br2 floating around, right? But what we can do is we can homolytically cleave that nitrogen bromine bond. So just like we saw before, we can use heat or UV light that has enough energy to do homolytic cleavage. You can kick one electron to that bromine, then the second electron over to that nitrogen. And cleave the bond, resulting in a nitrogen with an unpaired electron and a bromine radical. <coughs> the, like I said, the nice thing with this is it limits the amount of Br2 in solution or elemental bromine in solution. And this is pretty nice. Now that we've generated the radical, we can do the hydrogen abstraction and propagation step. And we'll go through and do a couple of examples of these. But let's take a look at the overall reaction before we do the complete one. Oops. So for example, with cyclohexene, if we treat this with NBS and UV light, we can attach a bromine onto that allylic carbon. And in this case, we do end up with a mixture of enantiomers, so that bromine can add the top face or the bottom face. It's important to remember that those radicals are trigonal planar and so you lose your stereochemistry off of that carbon. Does that make sense? Let's try a different one though. Write out the complete mechanism for the following. <clears throat> 
All right, and so this one's going to be a little bit trickier. We still are going to be using NBS and UV light, but then the question is, what will our product or products be for this reaction? And we do want to include the entire mechanism as well. So do you guys want a minute to work on this, or do you want to do it as a class? As a class? <laughs> okay. That was quick, so I'm going to take that at face value. What's the first step anytime you do a radical reaction? Initiation. All right, so for initiation, we know we have to draw out the MBS. And like we said, we can do the homolytic cleavage that results in a nitrogen radical where nitrogen has an unpaired electron and the bromine radical. So initiation is always the step where you generate your radical. <coughs> and I'll draw in UV light there so we know that that's the energy source. All right, next step is propagation. And in propagation, all we really care about is the radical that we formed and what it's going to be doing. So in this case, we've got the bromine radical that we formed during the initiation. We've got our starting material that was our alkene. And then the question is, which proton do you think is going to be the easiest to abstract? The middle one. Not only is it tertiary, but it's resonance stabilized, right? So we've got this proton right here hanging off. We know that this bromine can do a hydrogen abstraction. Let me clean this up. I don't like that arrow. There we go. So now we formed HBr, hydrobromic acid. And then in addition, we formed the alkane radical right there. And like I said before, these radicals are unusually stable because of resonance. So let's draw the resonance structure. So now the pi bond's right there, and the unpaired electron is on this carbon. So that's our resonance-stabilized allylic radical. <coughs> and then what's the next step? Does anybody remember? Termination. Not termination, right? We haven't added our halogen yet. We've got to do a halogen abstraction. So for each of these radicals, we need to do a halogen abstraction. So I'm actually going to show two different arrows, one for each of these radicals. And the goofy thing with this is anytime you're working with MBS, there is a trace amount of Br2 present. And that usually is a result of the bromine radical from the initiation step actually coupling with another bromine radical. And so you maybe have a tiny, tiny amount but not enough for it to be competitive with the other addition reaction we don't want. So during this step, we've got trace bromine around. So we'll show both products. So for example, for this product, I'm actually going to erase these resonance arrows just for clarity's sake. I'm going to steal one bromine, and then the second one gets kicked off right there. And for this one, I'm going to steal a bromine. And the second bromine gets kicked off there. So for the top resonance structure, actually, I'm going to show stereochemistry just to be super thorough. We've got bromine added into that central carbon. And we know we can get the enantiomer where bromine's a wedge and that methyl group's a dash. And then for the bottom one, it looks pretty similar. <coughs> but this time, the bromine's coming off that side position. And do I have to worry about an enantiomer for that one? No, we don't have to worry about that. All right, so for this reaction, we get three different products, right? We get a pair 
of products where the bromine is attached to that central carbon. So it could be either R or S. And then we could get it where the bromine is added to the less substituted carbon down below. So three different total products. <coughs> like I said, the main thing to pay attention to with propagation is we regenerate our radical. All right, and then what's the last step going to be? Termination. Termination. All right, and with termination, we can take any radicals that are present, couple them together in order to give a neutral organic compound. So maybe in this case, two bromines can find each other, which we know happens because we do have a very small amount of elemental bromine in solution that we use during our propagation step. So it's a little bit unusual. The whole purpose of this reagent, though, I can't emphasize this enough, is to limit the amount of bromine. It doesn't mean you have no bromine in solution. It's just you want as little as possible. So it's kind of a clever workaround. Does that make sense? Typically, when you do these reactions, though, if you notice, we go up. Cyclohexene only gave two products, a mixture of enantiomers. Typically, the alkene that's used, your allylic alkene, is symmetric to avoid getting this huge mixture of products. However, there are some cases, like in our practice problem, where we had an unsymmetric alkene, and that led to more than two products. So you do have to watch out for that anytime you don't have symmetry. Yep? So for those two steps, would you do the NPS with like two Yeah, absolutely. Any two radicals combining together counts for the termination step. I normally do the two bromine radicals just because it's easier to draw. All right, so let's move on to the next reaction. The next reaction you guys have actually seen before, but we didn't go over the mechanism. And this was addition of HBr um, in the anti-Markovnikov position. So let's do a little bit of review. <coughs> what reagents do I need to add the bromine to the more substituted carbon. Yeah, just HBr, right? We know in this one that this is Markovnikov addition. <laughs> and I think we saw that the first day of this term. All right, and then we saw a second example where we said we can actually do a similar reaction, but we can get bromine added anti-Markovnikov. And what reagents did we need in order to do that? Yeah, it's exactly the same as the top one, but we said if there's any peroxides around, it does anti-Markovnikov chemistry. So HBr, and then we said peroxides. In this case, are usually drawn out as ROOR. So let's take a look at the mechanism behind this and try to figure out why it's anti-Markovnikov rather than Markovnikov. The mechanism is really similar. <coughs> so step one we know is initiation. And initiation we know we need to generate a radical and typically during our initiation step, we're breaking the weakest bond present. In this case, the weakest bond present is actually in our peroxide. So oxygen-oxygen bonds are unusually weak. Meaning they're easy to break. Okay, so our initiation step starts with our peroxide. We can treat this with heat. We don't even need UV light here. And then we'll do a homolytic cleavage of our peroxide and we'll generate two oxygen radicals. So that's our initiation step. A little bit different, but same idea. And then step two, before it does anything, it actually reacts with the HBr. 
<laughs> and it will do a hydrogen abstraction with the HBr. So now we formed an alcohol plus our bromine radical. So the bromine radical is what we care about at this point. All right, so now let's take a look and we're going to do addition to the pi bond. All right, and so we've got our radical that we've generated, which is our bromine radical. We've got this pi bond and we're going to do addition to the pi bond where the bromine adds in, not the oxygen radical, and we form a new covalent bond between bromine and carbon, and we end up with the radical right there. Why do you think this radical is formed? What's special about that radical that makes it somewhat stable? Yeah, it's tertiary, right? We know radicals prefer to be on the mo most substituted carbon. So in this case, we prefer to form the tertiary radical. That ultimately explains why the bromine's added to the less substituted carbon, because we want the radical side to be on the most substituted carbon. All right? So we formed our relatively stable radical, but we haven't regenerated our bromine. So in the second step, We've got hydrobromic acid floating around still. This radical will do a second hydrogen abstraction, pluck off a hydrogen. And then regenerate our bromine radical. So the key thing in the propagation step, like I said, is regenerating the radical. All right, and then what should come next? Termination. And like I said, with termination, the only thing that matters is that you have two radicals, doesn't matter which ones, combining together to give you a neutral organic compound. <coughs> but the propagation step is an essential step for this reaction that explains why the bromine's not installed on the more substituted carbon. Instead of worrying about having the most stable carbocation, we're actually worried about having the most stable radical, and that changes the regiochemistry for everything. Does that make sense? All right. We have one more reaction we want to cover today. And this was also one we've seen before, but we actually skipped over the mechanism, so I'm doing this kind of out of order. And this was the dissolving metal reduction that we saw in Chapter 10. And we saw in chapter 10 that you can reduce an alkyne into a transalkene using a special set of reagents. Does anybody remember what those are? Sodium metal. Sodium metal, yeah, it's not Lindler's. Lindler's, we know that would give us cis. We said sodium metal and what solvent? Ammonia. ammonia. And this is liquid ammonia. This reaction is actually a unique radical reaction, and I did want to show it to you. Yep. Yeah, so the not sign indicates that it's a metal. Mm -hmm. Anytime we're working with a metal that's not often seen in its metallic state, you put that not sign in to indicate this isn't a cation. It's the actual metal sodium. Because okay. 90% of the time when we're looking at sodium, we're looking at it as a cation, and that throws people. So this clarifies it's not a cation, it's the metal. Okay, so we've got this sodium, and we know sodium likes to form the cation, like I just said. So it's not happy with that electron. It would rather give it up. Okay, so let's take a look at what can happen with an alkyne. We've got this unhappy sodium. It does not want this electron. So instead, it's going to say, hey, you take this electron. So it's going to kick one electron over to one of those carbons. That carbon now, though, is violating the octet rule, which is a big problem. So instead, this alkyne will make do by moving one of its pairs of electrons over to the next door carbon. So if you notice, this mechanism has both a single-headed arrow and a double-headed arrow. 
The single-headed arrow is the movement of the electron from sodium to the carbon. And then the double-headed arrow shows we're breaking one of the pi bonds and moving it to the other carbon. All right, and when we do this, that carbon-carbon bond now has a double bond. We know our final product is going to be trans. The radical is going to be on this right carbon. And then the left carbon is going to have two electrons. And what should the formal charge be on the left carbon? Minus one, right. And this is unique. We don't see this very often, at least in our level of chemistry, but this is called a radical anion. <coughs> but this does help explain why we're observing trans rather than cis um, regiochemistry. Why do you think we're observing trans rather than cis? Think back to first term with molecular shape. We had Vesper theory, you guys remember that? What was the big idea in Vesper theory? Yeah, electrons don't want to be close to one another. They want to be as far apart from one another as possible. This helps explain that, right? That anionic side does not want to be close to that radical electron. Those electrons would prefer, prefer to orient themselves opposite of one another, so you end up with the trans product. All right, in the next step, we have ammonia around. Ammonia is a really crummy acid, right? Normally we think of ammonia as a base. However, this position here is a super strong base. We know that uh, carbons with negative charges are really, really unhappy. And so in this case, it's going to steal a proton from ammonia. Ammonia has a pKa of about 38, which means that this is almost never observed unless you've got a carbanion, meaning a carbon with a negative charge. So now we've protonated our anionic side, but we still have to deal with this radical position. However, typically we do this reaction with excess sodium. So in the next step, sodium can contribute one more electron. Say, hey, you look unhappy. Why don't you have another one? <laughs> and again, we formed an anion. And what do you think will happen next? Same thing. It'll steal a proton from ammonia. And you end up with the hydrogens being trans to one another. This is very different than Lindler's catalyst. Lindler's catalyst we know to cis stereochemistry, and that has more to do with the catalytic cycle of using Lindler's catalyst. Um, this mechanism is actually stoichiometric, meaning we do need a full e two equivalents of sodium, and we need a lot of ammonia as our solvent. So it isn't a true catalytic cycle here. <coughs> That's a good question. So it's tough to understand how a mechanism actually is, which mechanism is correct. I should rephrase that. And so in order to prove this, they can actually do a cool experiment called electron paramagnetic resonance spectroscopy. So that's a mouthful. Most people just call it EPR. And EPR will only look at unpaired electrons, meaning radicals. And so what they did to study this mechanism was they actually did this in a sealed tube, added sodium, did the reaction in their EPR machine, and they saw a signal. And they said, aha, there must be a radical in this mechanism. This is the mechanism that best explains the presence of that radical. So they can do a lot of spectroscopy in order to figure out which mechanism is most likely to be correct. So the weird thing in organic chemistry, we can't prove a mechanism. We can only come up with overwhelming evidence that it's most likely to occur. It's kind of the weird paradox of science. All right, I think what we'll do is Stop right now. I wanted to give you guys a little bit of extra time as a small group in class to work on your pod. So if you guys want, you can pull out your pod, push tables together, and get started on that. 
On Monday when we come in, we're going to switch gears and talk about polymerization and radical polymerization. Yeah, let me stop the recording really quick.